I'm so happy uh, to be here and, and to welcome you, Danielle, to our school, Hudson County Community College. And um, Ms. Teju, please take it over. We're welcoming the amazing, the incredible Miss Danielle M. Jones, Scholars EOF. Let's give it up first and foremost for our beautiful, incredible guest here today. Let me see those clapping emojis. Clap, unmute yourself, however you would like. Let's welcome her with a warm welcome to our EOF program here at Hudson County Community College. Yes! First and foremost, just introduce Ms. Danielle Jones. She is a student communication and leadership development specialist for the Educational Opportunity Fund at Brookdale Community College. In addition to this, she oversees the program Outreach and Communications. She serves as a club advisor to both the EOF Scholars Alliance, EOFSA, and the Delta Alpha Chapter of Chi Alpha Epsilon National Honor Society at Brookdale. In 2017, Danielle continued to serve as a graduate intern for the Senator of Robert Menlendez, Democrat, New Jersey, Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of New Jersey, and Legislative District number 11 for General Assembly members of Eric Hoffetaling and Joanne Downey. In fall 2019, Danielle continued to serve as a graduate fellow for the Office of Secretary of Higher Education for OSHI for the state of New Jersey. She currently is serving as a sector representative for the county colleges of Central and South regions for the EOF Professional Association of New Jersey of EOF PNJ. In March, 2020, Danielle was named chair of government relations committee for the EOF PNJ program. Danielle enjoys planning in outreach and advocacy events to educate scholars as our EOF scholars here today and throughout the state of New Jersey about civic engagement service, voter education, and government. Danielle will continue to start her six-month fellowship for the New Jersey chapter of New Leaders Council. We want to welcome you, Danielle. You are incredible. Thank you so much for being here. EOF, give it again a round of applause. Hey, 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 hey. Danielle's incredible. Let's say, let me just say. <laughs> Thank the you so much. The floor is yours. <laughs> and like, I'm so grateful that I had melanin because I am blushing hard right now. But thank you so much for the kind words and the welcome. It really is a pleasure to be here. And I really want to thank the opportunity, especially for Mr. Lowe, to invite me to come meet with you and to talk to you about advocacy. Like, how could you be an advocate, especially as an EOF scholar? So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I do have a long slide deck. So I do not want you to be overwhelmed or embarrassed if you're trying to take notes. Not only is this being recorded, I will make sure that Mr. Lowe gets my slide deck after it's completed. So that way you guys can have access to it at any time. And also the other thing I wanna share with you guys is that if some of this information that I'm sharing with you is brand new to you, you've never heard of it before, or even if you haven't understood it before, please do not be embarrassed or ashamed. A lot of this information that I'm about to share with you, I didn't learn it until a few years ago. I'm not an expert, but I am enthusiastic and I'm passionate about education. And my goal is to share this information and resources with you. So today's workshop is called Advocacy and You, and it's specifically prepared for the Hudson County Community College EOF program. So this is tailored just for you. So a little bit about me, as Ms. Tejal shared with you guys, I actually earned my associate's degree from Brookdale Community College. So my degree, my associate's degree is in social sciences, but I have a concentration specialty in psychology. I did earn my bachelor's degree in, so, in psychology with a sociology minor from Cabrini University, which is located in Pennsylvania, right by Villanova University. So as you can see, I'm not your traditional history political science major, but yet I'm still involved with advocacy and government. I am currently working on my master's in public administration at Seton Hall University. And as Ms. Tejal shared, like I do work for the EOF program at Brookdale. I do serve two roles for the EOF Professional Association New Jersey. And starting on January 1st of this year, I was elected, I was sworn in as councilwoman for the borough of Eaton Sound in Monmouth County, New Jersey. So that's just a little bit about what I do. Yes, I'm busy. Yes, I do a lot. 
but I love what I do, but more importantly, I feel that I'm called to do the work that I'm doing. So I'm very passionate about the work I do, okay? Now, if you do have questions, I encourage you to type them in the chat. I'm not going to go over every single slide because we do have an hour and shameless plug at 630 we have our EFP and J presents meet the Greeks event tonight so I hope y'all are attending and I will be facilitating that event okay so I hope to see some of you guys at 630. Okay, so I'm going to my goal is I want to tie everything together and why is advocacy tied into related to government and how that affects or influences higher education. So um, like I said, if you have questions, please type them in the chat. I will try to address them either as they come or I'll make sure, cause I did block off about the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes for question and answers. Uh, but- uh, Danielle, I don't know if you want Rosie to monitor the chat box. Sure, that would be great, but um, I'll keep an eye on it as well. Okay. Um, so, cause I, if there's certain questions that deal with a certain slide, I'll try to answer them. Otherwise we can leave, leave them at the end. Thank we'll you. see how it goes. Okay. So first we're gonna start with the Higher Education Act of 1965. This is the act, the federal law that established the colleges and universities that you see today. So it was signed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965 as his um, key, like one of the key pieces of his war on poverty. So if you've heard of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that's all part of the war on poverty. And the main purpose of it was to strengthen the educational re uh, resources at colleges and universities. And that's where it created financial aid. So the financial you receive, aid rec you receive on the federal and the state level was established by the Higher Education Act of 1965. And here's a fun fact. The law was signed by President Johnson at his alma mater, Texas State University. Now, this is a video about the Higher Education Act. I encourage you guys to watch it when you have a chance. Like I said, one, I'm tech efficient, not tech savvy, so I don't want this to freeze. And two, I want you to watch it on your own because I wanna be mindful of your time, but I also want you to understand the history behind it. One of the things I always tell people is to do your homework and do your research. It's important to know your history because then it helps you understand what's currently going on. And prayerfully, we don't make the same mistakes that we made in the past. So what does this all mean? How do you effectively advocate for an issue, cause, or project? Okay. Oops, went a little too far. What is going on here? Okay, so I'm a big old nerd. I like I like to study. I like to understand what things mean. So, what is an advocate? An advocate really means it's you, you're supporting or arguing in support of, of for a cause or a policy or an issue. Okay, and that's why I want you to understand. And you can express being an advocate in so many different ways. But that's the thing. The key thing. You need to understand that when you advocate for something or you're being an advocate for somebody, you're supporting or you're at arguing for a specific cause or policy or matter. Okay. So what are some keys to be a successful advocate? Once again, do your research, know the facts. People can tell when you're talking out of your neck and you don't know what you're doing. So do your homework. It doesn't mean you have to be the expert on that issue. Just at least know the basics. And if someone asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, say, that's a good question. Let me find out the answer for you and I'll get back to you. And if you don't have the answer, but you know the person or organization that does, connect that person to them. It's okay that you don't know everything, but you at least should know the basics. What ties into that is number two, 
know who you should be advocating to. Sometimes people think that a certain group of people or a certain individual is the one that makes the final decision. And that may not be the case. And sometimes you'll find out that the, per the people you're advocating to, they support you, but they're not the ones making the decisions. So it's always important, know who you should advocate to. And that's part of doing your homework. Number three, you wanna build relationships, find allies, okay? It's so important because we all need to be in the room when decisions are being made. Um, the, the late Shirley Chisholm said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I would also argue, and I'm paraphrasing it, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu being eaten. So it's really important that you have a seat at the table or you're in the room when decisions are being made. But what if you can't? This is where an ally comes in. They can advocate for you. So it's so important to build relationships and build allyships. So if you're not able to be in the room when decisions are being made, that person who is can advocate for you. And then number four, you wanna educate your peers. It's so important to share the information that you learn with other people. You may be the missing link for your friends, your family members, your coworkers, fellow students to take to become advocates or allies or understand the importance of a certain issue or matter. Don't hold withhold the information to yourself. Be willing to share it. And it's okay if you don't know everything. Have energy and at least do the basics. Know the basics, do your homework. Because you never know what fire or light you spark in somebody when you share that information with somebody else. I remember when people shared with me the importance of voting and how governments works on the local level, county, state, and even federal, that ignited a passion in me and that's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing today. Okay. is going on here. So a new model of advocacy. This is one of my favorite quotes. And I want you guys to think about what we witnessed over the summer with the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Yes, demonstrations and protests are important. I will never tell you not to do that. But advocacy is not just about pro like protesting or demonstrating or throwing up a hashtag and retweeting something or reposting something. It's about being connected and educated about issues, networking with other communities, building allies, getting involved with your government. And that's the new model of advocacy. And especially now because we are in this online remote environment, and I hope to explain this to you as we go through the program, there are ways you can get connected with your local county, state, even federal government that you now have access to because advocacy has changed. I really think, especially after we get past this pandemic, gone are the days where you just meet in person and you schedule a meeting to meet with somebody one-on-one -on -one and you talk to them or you go to like, like events in person. We all know for better or for worse, we have access to technology whether it's Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, we have social media at our, at our fingertips. It could be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat. We have all these resources. So I really think there's gonna be a new model of advocacy, but the key that I want you to understand is you need to be engaged and it needs to be engaged continuously. It's not just a one-time thing. You need to, and you you mold that, you you mix that with protests, demonstrations, voting, all these different things. So, what civic engagement? Now, the simplest definition that I will give you is that you're you just want to make a dif difference in your community. But how do you do it? 
there's four parts to civic engagement. And I promise you, you're probably already doing them or have participated in those activities and not just not know it. One is civic action. So if you volunteer or you do service learning or you participate in activities. So how many of y'all have done a walk for breast cancer or autism awareness, things like that? You've participated in a fundraiser. You've raised money for like a specific cause. That's civic action right there. Civic do commitment is just having a desire to make a positive com contribution to your society or your community. Civic skills, they include different things like conflict management, conflict re resolution, listening, active listening. Those are some important civic skills that not only help with advocacy, but I promise will go help you with so many different areas of your life, whether it's personal or professional. And the last thing is social cohesion. It's building those relationships, having the sense of trust or bonding with other people. And I know, honestly, a lot of us did not anticipate still be going to school online or from home. And it's okay. Even though it's a little bit more difficult, you can still build bonds and relationships with people, even in this virtual environment. So, and there's many ways to do it. Get involved with the club organization on campus. They're probably meeting virtually and still holding events. If there's like a fellowship event online, whether it's through Facebook Live, Instagram Live, or even just like, like virtual happy hours on Zoom. Now I'm not encouraging underage drinking, let me be clear. However, there are still things you can do even in this remote environment and you can still build relationships because you never know who you're gonna connect with. The people you may connect with may be for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. So even though we're still in this online environment, you did not anticipate going to school or starting school in this type of environment, but you can still be successful. So I encourage you to still stay engaged and involved with your school, and especially with the EOF program here. So how is the government all involved? So here are some legislators or some agencies that you should be advocating to. So I have this video right here about in the map about the electoral college. You may be thinking, what the heck does the electoral college have to do with higher education? I'm glad you asked. Here's how I explain it to you. Okay. So, so the electoral college is how we also elect our president of the United States. So there's 538 electors. There's 100 senators and 438 House of Representative members. So each state has a certain amount of electoral votes. So if you look at the state of New Jersey, we have 14 electoral college votes. Okay, did my computer freeze? So how many electoral votes does New Jersey have? So first, how many senators do we have? We have two, Robert Menendez and Cory Booker. So those are our senators and they re represent the entire state of New Jersey. How many House of Representative members does New Jersey have? The answer is 12. And that gives us a total of 14 electoral college votes. How does that make sense? Here we go. So there are regulating bodies or government agencies that oversee higher education. So in the federal government, the, governing, the government agency is the US Department of Education. The nominee for the Secretary of Education is Miguel Cardona. There's also an office of post-secondary education, but that's all through the US Department of Education. And on the state level, we have the office of the Secretary of Higher Education. And our cabinet center, our acting secretary is Brian Bridges. 
Now, this is how the electoral college ties in. So the, the legislative branch, which is the United States Congress, passes the laws that affect higher education. Now, there's two committees, one in the House and one of the, uh, the House of Representatives and one in the Senate. The Senate is seen over, it's ruled by the Committee of Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. They have not announced a chair yet, and here's why. In the Senate, it's a 50-50 tie between Democrats and Republicans. So they are still deciding which Republicans will lead certain committees and which Democrats will lead certain committees. That is why we do not have a chair at this current moment. In the House of Representatives, higher education is ruled by the Committee on Education and Labor. The chair is Representative Bobby Scott, who's a Democrat from Virginia. The reason why they have a chair is that even though it's a small majority, the Democrats have the majority in the House of Representatives. That is why you see the chairs of the committees are led by Democrats. So your vote matters and your vote counts. And that's why it's so important with the Electoral College, because if the Senate had a majority of Democrats, whether it was 51 to 49, 60 to 40, whatever the majority was, the chairs would be Democrats. But because it's a 50-50 tie, that's why it hasn't been decided yet. So what's the state legislative branch that oversees higher education? The answer is the New Jersey legislature. And there's two houses in the New Jersey legislature, just like on the federal level. There's the state Senate and the General Assembly. In both houses, there are higher education committees. The chair in the state Senate is Senator Sandra B. Cunningham. And the chair in the General Assembly is Assemblywoman Mila M. J.C. And here's a fun fact. Both chairs are women of color. So who should you advocate to? So who are your federal and elected state officials? So what I did is I looked up using the campus address here for Hudson County Community College to find out who your legislators are. Oh, and that shifted, I'll fix that later. So for the United States Congress, if you wanna know who your congressman is, and the great, and what I did was to make it easy for you guys, if you click on the, the image, it'll take you right to the website. And right here where it says contact your member, you see right underneath it, you're gonna type in your address. That will tell you who your Congress members are on the Senate and in the House of Representatives. So in New Jersey, our two senators are Robert Menendez and Cory Booker. And, and as Ms. Tejal shared with you guys, I was an intern for Senator Robert Menendez in 2017. You're a congressman because Hudson County Community College is in legislative congressional district 10 is Donald M. Payne Jr. So if you click on the names, it'll take you to their website. So it'll take you to their Senate website. And then for Representative Payne, I'll take you to his House of Representatives website. Okay, so here's, here's what it looks like in New Jersey. There are 40 legislative districts in the state of New Jersey. And each district has about 210,000 people. Each district has one Senator and two assembly members. Now, normally in, in non-pandemic times, we would redistrict, which means there would either be more districts or less districts based on the population from the census done this year. But because we voted in favor to push the date back in the 2020 election, it will be redistricted in 2023. This is the website for the New Jersey legislature. Once again, if you click on the picture, it'll take you right to the website. And you see the circle right here? If you click on, if you see right there, it says members, you can find your members that way. 
And as you can see right here, you can find your members by alphabetical order. Municipality is just a fancy way of saying city, town, borough, village, things like that. Okay. Also, you can find it by district. So if you know what legislative district you live in, you can find it by the number. So Jersey City has two legislative districts. It's based on what ward you live in, okay? So if you live in Jersey City, you need to know what ward you live in and you'll find out what district you're in. So if you're in District 31, your state senator is Sandra Cunningham, who happens to be the chair of the Higher Education Committee. Your assembly members are Nicholas, um, I always get his name wrong. It's, um, oh, go ahead, Jose. Nicholas uh, Chiba, 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 Chiba Vadi, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I always get his name wrong. It's such a tongue twister. And, and here's the thing, he works at an institution of higher education. He's a great ally. Yeah, he, he works at Hudson. There you go, yep. bingo. So that is someone you should be contacting and you should be inviting to your campus programs. The other assembly member is Assemblywoman Angela McKnight. Now, if you live in District 33, your state senator is Brian Stack, and your assembly members are Anesh Shaparo and Raj Mukherjee. Now, I've actually met Assemblyman Mukherjee before. He's a really nice guy. And you may wonder, he looks kind of young. Yeah, he is young. He's actually younger than me. So I want you guys to understand, don't let age stop you from getting involved with your government. OK, because your voice matters and your voice is important. And you, you have something important to contribute. So don't let the fact that you look young or you have or you're young in age stop you from getting involved and in possibly even stopping you from running from office. OK. The other thing is, especially because we're at a, a community college, you are also governed by your county government. So here is a screenshot of your Hudson County Board of Chosen Commissioners. They used to be called your, your, your freeholders, but that title has changed effective January 1st. So right here, if you click on the image, it'll take you right to the website, but it has all your elected officials in your county, including your county sheriff, your county clerk, and all your board of chosen freeholders, because they are also involved with the funding you receive for Hudson County Community College, which plays a role in your tuition and your fees. So it's so important that you are pay attention and you know who you're voting for when it comes to the county government. So now it's called, it's we're at now what? How can you get involved? What are some things you can do, especially as a student? So we have some uh, advocacy opportunities through the EOF program. We have the Alliance of EOF Students of New Jersey. We have the, our statewide student day at the Capitol. We now have an awareness, advocacy awareness month. And we have our Advocacy Awareness Day. So AESNJ. Now, do you guys currently have a chapter of AESNJ? Perfect. So this is a great way to engage in civic engagement and advocacy. Because AESNJ provides leadership training opportunities. You, you learn to exercise social responsibility. And the great thing is you get to network not only with other youth leadership organizations, but you get to network with other campus chapters of ASNJ across the state. We have two ASNJ advisors. And if you wanna learn more about ASNJ, I have the website right here in the slide deck. Next is Statewide Student Day at the Capitol. Pretty soon in the month of March, next month, 
we're going to have a state, a student day at the Capitol. It's going to be a virtual town hall, but you are invited to, and I encourage you to participate. And it's, co it's coordinated by my government relations committee. And normally in the past, when we did it in person, you were, you as well as staff are invited to come down to the state house in Trenton. You meet with legislators, the EOF central office, as well as staff members from the office of secretary of education. You also get to network with other EOF programs statewide, but you learn how to become an advocate and you meet your state legislators. We're still gonna do it this year. It's just gonna be looking a little different. It's gonna be a virtual meeting and I encourage you to participate. So you're gonna see flyers for that really soon. And I encourage you to register. We also have our EOF Awareness Day. That's usually the same day as our State Graduate Achievement Award cer Ceremony. So okay. we use the hashtag I am EOF and J, and you share your story about what EOF means to you, not only on your pro the EOF program social media, but yours. And we wanna share it with everybody we know like our neighbors, our communities, our family members. This is what EOF is. I am a proud member of EOF, and this is why you should support EOF. Okay. So how can you be an effective advocate for EOF? Vote, 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 vote. I can't say enough, you need to vote. And here's some other ideas. You want to write a letter to your state senator or your assembly members, record a video about what EOF means to you. These are just some of the options, but the best thing to do, go vote. Here are some ideas if you're involved in a student club or organization. Collaborate. You want to partner with other clubs and organizations on campus because they can also be advocates and allies for you. Work with your EOF office on programming because they can also incorporate civic engagement and advocacy initiatives. This workshop right here is about civic engagement and advocacy initiatives. That's one way to do it, but you can also partner with other organizations that do this work as well. You also want to partner with higher education advocacy initiatives. And some of them are done through the American Association of Community Colleges. This organization represents all the community colleges across the country. And here in the state of New Jersey, we have the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. What you may have heard recently from NJCCC is they have an opportunity where you can go to their website sign into the Legislative Action Center and sign a, a digital letter that's sent to Governor Murphy that advocates for you for him to support and include in the state budget an increase in funding for all 18 community colleges. That's an advocacy initiative that you can get involved with right now. And it's important because especially if you want to keep the tuition affordable at Hudson County Community College, not only do you need to advocate for state funding, but also for county funding. And those are some, and those are just a couple ways of how you can get involved in your student club or organization. Now, I believe you guys have a chapter for Alpha 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 National Honor Society, also known as Tri Alpha. This is the honor society for first generation college students. If you are eligible to join, I encourage you, join. It's a great way to show if you, especially if you are a first generation college student, your academic and your leadership achievements. And that's a great way to advocate for the success of opportunity programs. America needs you. And now this is a 501c3 nonprofit which fights for economic mobility and intense through intensive career train mentoring and training and development. And we have an active chapter here in New Jersey. So if you are eligible, I encourage you to apply and become a fellow and you actually get a stipend. What's so I would give it a try and you can follow them on social media. They're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The next organization is Braver Angels. 
Now, this is also a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but they're looking to depolarize or reduce the partisanship in American politics, grassroots organizing. And they especially love to work with academic academia. So that's another organization you can partner with. Because how do you talk to people, which goes back to civic engagement, using those civic skills of conflict management, conflict resolution, listening skills? How do you talk to people that have different opinions and beliefs than you do? Because we all have different life experiences. We grew up in different areas, had different family backgrounds, different life experiences. So it's not to say that people are right or wrong per se. It may be different. But how do you talk to people that are different from you? Braver Angels can help you with that. And they're also on social media. Campus Election Engagement Project. This is also another nonprofit organization. And they work nationwide to help faculty, staff, and student leaders to educate others on elections. OK? And they're also on social media. They have a great YouTube channel. And you can also apply as a student to become a campus a SEEP fellow, which get, and they do pay stipends. And you get to create voter education and initiatives and voter registration events. As an example, we have SEEP fellows at Brookdale Community College. What they worked on in the fall, even though it, it, it didn't come to pass, but this is something that the new fellows are working on, they were trying to make election day a paid time off holiday for Brookdale employees. And they also collaborated with the um, EOF office, as well as the EOF Student Alliance, which is our chapter of AES and J, to do voter registration and voter ed education initiatives. So those are, that's another great opportunity. Another one is League of Women Voters. This is, once again, a nonpartisan organization that helps educate people on voting issues especially public policy, they are also on social media and they have chapters in almost every state. They also have a very dynamic chapter in, here in New Jersey. Last but not least, exercise your right to vote. Let's see here. So what does it mean to vote? Oops, hold on one second. So what does it mean to vote? Basically, you're expressing your view. You're making a decision. You're, you're, ex you're exercising your choice. It could be something as simple as you get to choose what restaurant you go to eat at, all the way to formally voting for an elected official. But this is what it means to vote. Okay, did it freeze again? Okay. This is pulled right from the New Jersey state constitution. So just like there's a constitution in the United States of America, there's a constitution for the state of New Jersey. All political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for the protection, security, and benefit of the people. And they have the right at all times to alter or reform the same whenever the public good may require it. That's right from Article 1, Section 2, Subsection A, Rights and Privileges. So you have a state constitution and it explains the, your branches of government, what your rights and privileges are, and there are amendments. So I encourage you, get a copy of the New Jersey State Constitution because it's important for you to, you don't have to know everything inside out, but it's important to know what your rights are. So elections in New Jersey, there are two elections. You have a primary election and a general election. The primary election is very important and it's usually held the first Tuesday in June. You get to choose what candidates you want to see on the ballot in the general election in November. And in the general election, that's when you're officially voting for which candidate is going to take office. And in, in, in not only in New Jersey, but across the country, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November is election day. Now it's not a paid holiday. So let's keep that in mind. But it is 
a federally recognized day to elect your officials. In, in 2021, election day is going to be November 2nd, okay? Because the first Monday in November is November 1st. That's why election day is going to be on Tuesday, November 2nd. These are your rights to be an eligible voter in New Jersey. Basically, you need to be a United States citizen, whether you're nat nat you are um, US born or naturalized. You gotta be eight, at least 18 years of age. You have to be a resident for at least 30 days. You are not declared mentally incompetent by the court and you're not serving a sentence of incarceration. So basically you're not locked up. But let me be clear, if you're serving parole or probation, you can vote in the state of New Jersey. You may have to re-register to vote, but you can vote. So if you or someone you know is serving parole or probation, you now have the right to vote in the state of New Jersey. How are you? So how do you know if you're registered to vote? I'm going to repeat this website multiple times. Go to vote.nj.gov. But once again, if you click on this web, this picture, it'll take you right to the website. Just put your name and your birthday, and it'll tell you if you're registered to vote or not. You could also register to vote online. So starting in September 2020, you can register to vote online. If you want to do it by paper application, this is just a screenshot of what they look like. It's available in 12 languages. So I have it in English and in Spanish, but it's also available in, in Korean. It's also available in Portuguese. It's also available in French. It's available in 12 languages. How do you know what your polling place is? This is where you actually go to vote. Type in your address at vote.nj.gov. You're gonna click on polling place search. Type in your address, it'll tell you where your polling place is and that's where you're gonna to go to vote. You know how we have a bill of rights for the constitution? We have a voter's bill of rights here for the state of New Jersey. This tells you all the rights and privileges available to you as the New Jersey voter. This is available in English and in Spanish. The one thing I wanna to stress to you is that if voter intimidation, harassment, discouragement, or even just preventing someone to vote is illegal, don't do it. But if you know, or you're experiencing that, if you call 877-NJ-VOTER, you will officially file a complaint and it will be investigated by the New Jersey Attorney General's office, as well as the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State oversees all the elections in the state of New Jersey. The New, the New Jersey Attorney General is the leading law enforcement officer in the state of New Jersey. So it's very important that you let them know if you have any complaints about being able to vote in the state of New Jersey. Okay. How do you stay informed? You can follow, oh yeah, yeah, here we go again. You can follow the state, the New Jersey Division of Elections on social media, go to their website. They also have a free app available for you on your smartphone or tablet. So if you have an Android or an Apple, I encourage you download the free app. Hold on one second, what just happened? Okay. You also wanna check the League of Women Voters. They have this great thing called 411 and I'll show you what it looks like. It's an online resource that provides nonpartisan information. So you could actually register to vote. You could check your voter registration address. But the thing I love the most is you can find out what's on your ballot. So if you click on that, type in your address, it will tell you exactly what elections are being held and, and what level and what the importance of them are. I found this to be very important because when I was running for council last year, I actually completed my candidate bio. It's not mandatory, but I would encourage all candidates that are running for office, if, if the League of Women Voters reaches out to you, complete, the, complete your candidate bio. Because especially when I, like we were in the middle of a pandemic and I can't meet with people in person, how would people know who I am and understand what my campaign platform is. 
this is one way to use it. And Vote 401 is a great resource. So either they don't, if the candidates don't complete their bios, which I think they should, you can at least know who's running for office and what the office does and how it impacts you. Okay, so we are at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing. And like I said, I know it's a lot of information. And do not feel bad if you've never heard some of this information before. Do not feel embar like em embarrassed or ashamed or guilty. A lot of this information I didn't learn until I became a political intern. And some of it I didn't even learn until I ran for office. But the key is this, once you learn something valuable, I want you to share it with other people. It's very important that you don't withhold this information or keep it to yourself because you may be the missing piece or the missing link for other people to get involved and become advocates. So I'm gonna open up the floor. Is there any questions or comments or concerns that you wanna ask me? You can either type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and share the, the questions with the group. I just want to say that was a really lovely presentation. I loved it so much. I, I, I There's like so much I didn't really know about up until now. And I'm like, wow, like the sky's the limit. Sebastian, thank you so much. And that's the key. Like there are so many opportunities and ways for you to get involved. And especially if you want, because one of the things I believe in is I want people to have access to an affordable college education. That's why it's so important that I show all the relationships and the links. I don't know everything. I am not an expert on everything, you know, higher education or government related, but I'm very passionate and I know what I know and I know it well. And I'm willing to share it with people. But I also have a great resource of networks and mentors. So if I have a question, I could go right to them. Even my elected officials, because I live in Legislative District 11 and I talk to them frequently. And especially when it comes to higher education matters, I, I pick their brain all the time. I'm like, what's going on? What do my scholars need to know so I can share it with them? Because especially after this latest election in 2020, and I don't know if, any, who, if anybody attended the EOF town hall on inauguration day, we saw what happened at the US Capitol on January 6th. It's related to us. I don't think it's a, it, I don't think there's a coincidence that it happened the day after the state of Georgia elected a Jewish American and an African American to the Senate. I don't think it's a coincidence that it happened after we elected a, a Jamaican South Asian woman as vice president. I don't think it's a coincidence because we elected a black man to the president of the United States back in 2008. It was awful. And but we need to understand that our voice in our matters and our voice in our vote is important. I don't care how many times people say, eh, the, this, the government's rigged. Well, how are you gonna fix the system if you're not voting for the right people? I tell people, especially in my hometown, cause I actually serve on the council in my hometown. If you don't think I'm doing a good job, then don't you dare reelect me. You need to hold me accountable. But I also need to hear from you. What's important to you? And trust me, especially after these snowstorms, I hear from them a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but the other thing is, is that I also tell them, you're barking up the wrong tree. I don't control the snow plowing. You need to talk to the Department of Public Works and I'll direct you to them. But it's important that I hear from them. You know what I'm saying? One, one resident was complaining that her street why was her neighbor's street clear, but her street wasn't? Well, her neighbor lived on a county road. She lived on a state, on a town-owned street. So her, she lives, so her street was cleared by the Department of Public Works in my town. Her neighbor who lives on a county road, the county took care of that. It's different responsibilities, different resources, different amount of manpower. I'll say people power because it can be man or woman. So it's it's so it's different. It's it's going to be handled in different ways. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you need to know who you advocate to. That's why I was saying, 
I'm glad to hear from you, but I have no control over who, who or what, what plows and when they do it. Well, I'll at least tell you, that's my job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much because you do your job so well. And <laughs> when I hear you talk about the right to vote, I was, I entered a documentary into the country when I was 17. Mm -hmm. I already pay my dues. I've been here 33 years doing anything I can to survive. But when I finally become a citizen, my first vote ever, because in order to vote in Mexico, you need to be 18. So mm -hmm. I never voted in my life. And when my first vote was for Obama. I like to tell my friends, it's thanks to my vote that he became president because mm -hmm. for me it was, I don't know, it was history. So now when I hear you talk about Georgia, I stay up all night. I was almost crying. I'm like, how can they vote for Warnock and not for Joe also? I, I never understood why the difference in votes. Like who, who goes to the ballot and choose one, but not the other? Like I thought it was <laughs> that right. Was And I just feel like, did it happen? Did it happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really interesting because actually my mother's from Georgia. So I pay attention to Georgia politics a lot. And what the way the ballot works, it's very different from the presidential election where if you vote for the president, you're automatically voting for the vice president. You get to choose who you want. So you can choose from different parties, different things like that. But what I always stress to people do your homework. You need to understand who you're voting for. It's not as simple as like, well, I'm a registered Democrat, so I'm just going to vote for the Ds. Vote for the people that you think will do the best job. I am a registered Democrat, but I have voted for Republicans in the past because I thought they would do a good job. That's what's key. You have to do your research, you know, and a lot of times people think voter um, disenfranchisement is just taking away the right to vote. It's making it difficult. It's not having information or resources available. So that's why we have to pay attention, especially us as communities of color and underrepresented groups in this country. We have to pay attention and hold people accountable. Now, I'm going to say this as nice as I can, and this is no offense to my non-melanated people on the call, I'm sick of old white men running the show. I am. It doesn't reflect who we are as a country. So how are we going to elect women, black men, Latinx men, Asian women? It doesn't matter. LGBTQ members, members with a disability. It doesn't. But how do we do that if we're not supporting them and voting for them? And that's why the primary election is so important. So do your homework. And I will make sure that Mr. Lowe provides my contact information. If you have questions, please reach out to me. And if I don't know the answer, I'll connect you to the people that do. Because I think it's so important that we pay attention. If someone is not doing their job or they don't represent you, you better vote them out. You need to hold them accountable. Because what you know what, especially the people that aren't doing their job count on, people like us not paying attention and they get reelected. So we have to pay attention. So Harado, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Uh, it was through the EOF that my dream is becoming a reality. Uh, I'm, uh, this is my, second, my fourth semester in HCCC. I got accepted into Rockers, so I wanted to say thank you because advocating for myself wasn't possible until I made the right, I met the right people. So EOF is part of my life now, and thank mm -hmm. you so much. I'm very happy I came. I almost didn't because I had something else to do. That's why I didn't RSVP, but I'm here. So <laughs> And I appreciate you. you. I appreciate you coming, and... That's one thing I love about EOF because EOF started because of advocacy with the Newark race riots. And we need to empower and equip our students, our scholars to become advocates. 
So I'm so thankful that you are here and you are part of this program so we can equip and empower you. And maybe you can help people, especially if they were undocumented residents that became citizens, empower them to become advocates and to exercise their right to vote. You never know. Thank you, Danielle, for your lovely presentation. I wanna uh, give a round of applause to Danielle. Um, use your emojis, 